uh, we have uh, 25 minutes. Thank you for coming and welcome to our school and the Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here um, and thank you very much for allowing me to present in, uh, in English. <laughs> Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Suarez's idea of uh, just war and the forever war um, in the United States on terrorism. And um, looking at these ideas as I'm writing on um, attempted material support and how there's a, an expansion of the criminal law. So um, Suarez answers the question, is war intrinsically evil? No, war must be waged by a leg legitimate power. The cause itself and the reason must be just, and the method of its conduct must be proper. Due proportion must be observed at its beginning, during its prosecution, and after victory. And so these ideas are very interesting in looking at um, the war on terrorism as it does not appear to be an obvious end. Um, and then the method, the other part that I'm really going to be looking at is the method of its conduct because in America we're now having, we have expansion of criminal laws just to, to try to combat terrorism and how that plays in with the idea of having a just war. I mean, I think we're a legitimate power for now. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, and, and <laughs> September 11th is obviously a very large um, uh, event. Um, so, um, there needs to be a legitimate and necessary nature. So war is permissible only that a state may guard itself from molestation. And so, once again, the part that I focus in on, if the cause in question should cease to exist, the just war would also cease to exist. Can we justify this on ongoing, um, when there, what would be an end? Uh, not every cause is sufficient to justify war, but only those causes which are serious and commensurate with the losses that the war would occasion. And so as it drags on, um, that is another part um, that's very interesting. So the three reasons for just war are the seizure by a prince of another's property, his refusal to restore it, the denial of the common rights of nations, uh, such as the right of transit over highways, trading in common, Etc. And then the one I bold will be the one that is relevant uh, to us, that any grave injury to one's reputation or, or honor. And uh, so it was really interesting reading all the, the limits um, Suarez already saw on, uh, on war, humanitarian wars, aiding a friendly country. Um, he did see that that was a possibility, but he saw how this could be abused, so only on condition that the friend himself would be justified in waging the war and consents thereto, either expressly or by invocation. And once again, if, if, if he, if he looked at if the reasoning in question were liberally allowing intervention were valid, it would always be permissible to declare such a war on the ground of protecting innocent little children. So you always have to try to um, keep the limits in mind. So um, after September 11th, in the week after September 11th, Congress authorized the president, and I quote from the authorization for the use of military force, um, to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks, as well as against those who harbored such organizations or persons. So this was an extremely broad resolution and um, having been in New York myself on September 11th, um, you, you could see how a very broad resolution might have passed in those weeks after September 11th. It was such a major event. But uh, 16 years later, this same resolution underpins uh, wide-ranging U.S. military operations targeting a diffuse jihadi uh, movement. So the war on terror is, um, I posit, a new kind of war. Uh, there's uh, unfortunately no obvious uh, end in sight, and uh, it's been used in the United States to have an expansion of our uh, criminal law. And so now I'm going to uh, shift to, to showing you where one specific part that I'm 
uh, writing about. I haven't finished my paper. I'm sort of in the beginning stages. So, um, so, uh, so I, I'll show you two part two two thirty two three three nine a, and then there's b, and then there's b, and b has no intent portion, which is what I find very, which is what's very interesting. But I'll stop. I'll start with two three three nine a, which is providing material support to terrorists. So the offense is whoever provides material support or resources or conceals or disguises the nature, location, source, or ownership of material support for, or resources, knowing or intending that they are to be used in preparation for or in carrying out a violation, and it lists out all the different terrorist crimes, uh, or in per profession, per pre preparation for and carrying out, and there's a, you cannot be in prison for more than um, 15 years. And so I bolded the knowing or intending because in 2339A there is an intent requirement. If you provide material support, knowing or intending that it's being used in a terrorist crime. So that would seem to be relatively straightforward, that would, that, that should be criminalized. <laughs> um, and so they give definitions and you'll see that the, the definitions are very broad. Material support means any property, tangible or intangible, or service, including currency or monetary instruments or financial services, lodging, training, and the, all these things have been litigated. What is training? Uh, expert advice, if you give legal advice to a terrorist organization, uh, expert advice, assistance, safe houses, false documentation, uh, you know, it goes on. And, and number two, the term training means instruction or teaching designed to impart a specific skill as opposed to general knowledge. And uh, three, the term expert advice or assistant means advice or assistance derived from scientific, uh, technical, or other specialized knowledge. Okay, so now I get to sort of my point of what I'm really examining in my paper is 2339B. And this is providing material support or resources to designated foreign terrorist organizations. So the United States designates, um, and there's a whole process, I think I'm going I'm to say the wrong number, I think there's about 30 currently um, designated terrorist organizations. And in, in this, with this statute, there, um, it's only, the only knowing part is providing the material support, not the intent for not the intent to actually um, have a, uh, a terrorist act, to help a terrorist act. So, sorry, I'll read you from the statute. Whoever knowingly provides material support or resources to a foreign terrorist organization or attempts or conspires to do so shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both, and if the death or any person results shall be imprisoned for any term of years or for life. So the only knowledge requirement is that the organization is a uh, terrorist, is a designated terrorist organization. So um, federal prosecu pr prosecutors are using Section 239B <coughs> to target not the fundraising Congress had in mind when enacted the offense, but rather the kinds of aid typically furnished by an organization's foot soldiers and sympathi sympathizers. Um, and this respects Section 239 2239B may be compared with principles of accomplice liability, which cover any and all types of aid. However, unlike uh, principles of accomplice liability, it does not require that the offender intended for the aid to facilitate the commission of any um, crime. And so, um, under 2239B, um, people are being uh, arrested and for going to an airport, and the idea is that they, they wanted to go to Syria to help ISIS, or they have texts that have been interpreted to, um, to want to aid uh, ISIS. And mo most of the cases are ISIS, but there's other uh, organizations as well. Um, and so this is a material support uh, case, United States versus Hayat, and I'll just read out to you the evidence against Hayat was that his maternal grandmother ran a religious school in Pakistan. He expressed repugnant views about the murder of American journalist Daniel Pearl. He kept a scrapbook of news articles about Pakistani politics and Islamic fundamentalism, including anti-American commentary. In conversations with a government informant, he first expressed interest in going to and then made excuses for not attending a terrorist training camp. After hours of questioning, beginning around 11 a.m., and lasting as the early morning hours of the following day, 
He finally agreed with FBI interrogators who repeatedly insisted, despite his continuing denials, that he had, in fact, attended such a training camp. Hayat carried in his wallet a written prayer, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that a government expert opined would be carried only by a jihadist, a person intent on waging war in the name of God. For this, Hayat is now serving a 24 year sentence <coughs> in federal prison. So notice he didn't actually do any, anything. Um, and so I, I, I quote from the dissent to paraphrase a famous line in this case, the government has concluded that it is not for it to say what offense Hamid Hayat has committed, but it is satisfied that he committed some offense for which he should be punished. This case is a stark demonstration of the unsettling and untowered consequences of the government's use of anticipatory prosecution as a weapon in the war on terrorism. And I pause here because when looking at the ideas of just war, it's always in the past tense. Um, and this is uh, now looking into uh, the future. And in anticipatory prosecution, the government proceeds on an inquit crime theory based on the harmful conduct that the government anticipates the person might commit. The government asks the jury to deprive a man of his liberty largely based on dire but vague predictions that he might commit unspecified crimes in the future. And so that was a material support case. So that was, I mean, get, there are now attempted material support, so it's even one step uh, removed. And looking at those cases, um, most of them are about, and not all of them are litigated all the way out, but a lot of them have plea deals. Um, a lot of them are going to the air, they go to the airport and they're stopped before getting on an airplane and they're, um, and it said that they were, they had the intention to go to Syria because maybe they had um, Googled Syria. Um, and then there's, uh, or they might have texts glorifying uh, ISIS. And many of the cases, the th there are themes of uh, misguided youth, uh, a lot of them are mentally ill, and then some of them that actually come up with some vague plot, they're actually completely impossible, like what they, you know, what they came up with is completely impossible. Um, and so I quote Seamus Hughes, a former National Counterterrorism Center official, he said, this is an abject failure, that there's no system in place that doesn't result in spending 20 years in jail. Um, in a few cities, the FBI is working with parents, mental health experts, community leaders, and sometimes religious figures to help minors or mentally ill people who agents believe may have some intent but not the capability to hurt anyone. Um, and then I, I, uh, oh, the next quote I have is from a father. He was worried about his son who had been going online and thought he might be looking at jihadi websites, or he himself, the father, called the, um, the FBI, and now his son is, uh, has 20 years in prison in solitary confinement, and he says, every minute, I just imagine him in that solitary confinement facing 20 years because I cooperated with the government. It's a horrible feeling. I, I can't get rid of it. Um, and then since I'm here in, the, in Europe, um, at, and I would like to look more into what laws are being adopted within the European Union. Uh, but the, um, the European Parliament and the Council had a directive, uh, 541, that you might be familiar with, and uh, it criminalizes and starting to look similar uh, traveling within and outside or to the EU for terrorist purposes, the organization and facilitation of such travel, training and being trained for terrorist purposes and providing or uh, collecting funds. And then I guess, and so, um, so it seems like a similar type uh, laws. The United Kingdom, after um, the, that series of uh, terrorist events they had, um, the Home, Home Secretary Amber Rudd recently announced that people who view terrorist content online um, could face up to 15 years behind bars which sounds very familiar to what we have in the United States, although in the United States with, the, with freedom of speech, um, there it's, they have to have kind of a run around with the attempted uh, material support because most people would have thought of that being um, protected by our First Amendment. 
So I haven't solved all of these problems. I'm sort of, as I said in the beginning stages of my um, of writing my paper, and so I sort of trying to. Uh, so terrorism is bad. So I'm kind of trying to simplify it all. <laughs> I think we could all here agree terrorism is bad, um, and getting terrorists before they act is good. I think um, that is, and so then it's trying to find the right. Um, a balance. Um, is this a just war, this forever war that we have 16 years in uh, that's justifying all this expansion in our law and just uh, criminal law? Um, our texts, online searches, are they actually indicative of actual future terrorist activity? Is there some correlation? Or like I said, a lot of the mentally ill uh, individuals, um, although obviously there is real uh, recruitment going, in, going on online as well, of course. Um, and, and then coming from the United States perspective, what is the difference about terrorism and mass shootings? Because there's a huge gap in our law. Um, if you look at the mass shooting incidents we've had, those people stockpiled weapons, they had you know, 27 guns, 1,000 grenades. And it, to me, that sounds like you're attempting a, a, a something, um, but those, would not, those people would not be um, that wouldn't be convicted under any sort of attempt laws the way that um, somebody who's looking at a jihadi website would be. Why, what, where is that, why is that different? Um, <coughs> and so then I end um, with a, um, a painting from a prisoner at Guantanamo Bay. Um, and some of these paintings, um, have just recently, they're in an exhibit in New York. Uh, this person was imprisoned for 16 years, and a lot of them are either now being released without ever having been um, charged, never even being charged uh, with anything. Um, and but some of their art is very, is very powerful. They could hear the ocean, but they couldn't actually s see it. Um, so right, that sounds like a really sad ending. I feel like I need to... <laughs> um, but, um, so, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for the communication. It has been important to have this moment open to a moment to be able to put questions aos nossos uh, dois congressistas. I have a question for Professor Leo Gris. Um, I wanted to know your thoughts about the, in this context of the, the concept of enemy combatant and how it was interpreted before 2008. Um, I'm sorry, how would I? I don't know if I can, I'm going to be able to answer your question. <laughs> how do you see the, the, the concept of enemy combatant, how it was interpreted by the Supreme Court in Randy and Randy versus Ramsell and, and uh, Razul versus Bush, I think, and how it relates to the just war theory? Well, I think that would be another, uh, another example of how I was talking about how I'm looking, I was looking specifically on um, Attempted materials for it's very narrow, but there's been so many expansions in so many different areas um, of our law because of um, this idea. What I'm the only reason it could be is the idea of this war against um, terrorism.
within international law, uh, international law, and the other is a metaphorical use of the notion of war for the use of state power within its jurisdiction. In this particular sense, looking at criminal law, and in that way we would be looking, for instance, at the constitutional limits of the interpretation and application of criminal law within the United States. So how do you think the two combine? So those are my two questions. Okay. Um, so first, I think, and I, I think there's still room um, to, to, I think to, you, you're asking whether it's still valid to look yeah. at. I, I think there, yeah, I, mean, I think there is still validity. Um, obviously, once again, it's a very different time, so you can't use, you know, not everything is going to fit, but I do think there is still room to look at um, in, in contemporary international law. And um, your second question How does the notion of war? International law relates to the action of the state in an internal, in right. internal jurisdiction using criminal law. Yeah, I think it's right. I think it is more of a um, they're using it more in theory than in actual. Yeah, it wouldn't count as an actual war, but they are using it more as a um, to justify their to justify their actions. Yeah. Um, I thank you very much. Just a question for you. Strangely enough, there's another subject that, that's, that's um, um, not only by Suarez, but, but, but all the, the, the second skill, I think, uh, in Molina, which is um, predestination? Predestination? Predestination. That, that applies also here, not, not only just war. And because uh, uh, and the question was, uh, and Suarez and Molina, most of them uh, argued that uh, even that God knows that the future act would occur, he could not punish it before it occurs. Okay? That would be unfair. Because that would be denied uh, freedom. So when in the second uh, 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 phrase that you put in the, in the last uh, conclusion, you said getting uh, uh, terrorists before they act is good, I would say no, it's bad. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, but of course I agree with you that if we uh, are able to stop them to do those terrible things, sure. So the, the question would be, uh, are those things that they are being arrested for uh, uh, um, can they really be, uh, as I said, the question should be, uh, all the things that they are being uh, imprisoned, imprisoned for can be defined as uh, terrorist acts or no? Uh, uh, because uh, if we go uh, arresting someone because he would do this if we don't arrest him, then we are denying uh, freedom and, 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 and there's no limit for it. So the question should be, is the, uh, what is done can be already defined as a terrorist act. So you, you're saying that the attempt that they're doing should be a criminal act as well in order to... I'm asking. Yeah, I mean that, that I would, it seems that there should be something more than going to an, an airport, you know, there, that, that there's no proof whether, where the person was indeed actually going to, I mean, it seems very, that seems very vague to me, to go to an airport, and, that, and that's where a lot of the arrests um, take place. And, and looking at things online, how do you, like, to say that that person's then going to actually act, it's hard to say. So I would say, you're correct, in, I would say getting someone before they act is, is bad if they really were going to act, but how do you know that? We don't have a, a crystal ball, unless, so that what their actions that they should have taken has to be more than going to an airport or looking at something online, I guess would be my um, idea. Does that make sense? que é o Sr. Fábio Fidelos, que é a seguinte, na sequência também daquilo que foi dito aqui com a Sra. Professora Ádia, a pergunta que eu coloco é o combate às 
literatura e à escravidão, que o cu, quer no Brasil, quer em que é Jardim, constituem ou não uma forma de guerra justa. Podemos ou não, ou devemos ou não entender que a luta contra a escravatura de um princípio de abolição da escravatura pode constituir uma forma legítima de guerra justa. Se há que ser a mão. Esses dois teóricos, eles não. Quer dizer, tanto na palavra do Padre Nóbrega, quanto é, na, defesa, na defesa estabelecida por, por Dom Luís de Serqueira, eles não excluem a possibilidade de, de, de redução à condição de escravo é, mediante a ocorrência de guerra justa. Isso está, digamos assim, presente dentro do quadro teórico estabelecido por ambos. Então, acreditamos que essa possibilidade está patente é, nos dois. É, o que nós é, evocamos e trouxemos nessa, nessas nossas falas é, comparece muito mais com a tentativa de se estabelecer uma compreensão do que ocorria efetivamente nesses territórios. Então, a possibilidade está posta, é vista como juridicamente possível, é, mas há, nos dois casuísmos, algo muito interessante, muito significativo, que é o diálogo com o que estava ocorrendo, tanto no Brasil quanto no Japão. Nos dois, nas duas falas está, isso não é absolutamente presente, não é natural na cultura, tanto do Japão quanto do Brasil. Outros autores, no caso do Brasil, citavam é, o empreendimento de guerras entre tribos, por exemplo, como natural, como uma prática natural. Nessa fala específica do Padre Nobre, ele coloca que não. É muito interessante essa primeira etapa do pensamento do Padre Nobre, está muito voltado para a defesa, para uma visão muito mais protetiva dos próprios índios. Uma segunda etapa jesuíta no Brasil já vai, é, digamos, não tem como se preocupar tanto, mas não, não ter essa, essa, esse impulso mais defensivo que encontramos no Padre Nobre. Bem, em Luís de Serqueiro, já também aqui, a, a mesma, é, no mesmo sentido, né, a observação de que isso não seria natural para os japoneses, que isso teria sido introduzido pelos portugueses. Então, é interessante, é um casuísmo é, visto aqui há algumas décadas, mas nós sentimos a mesma manifestação de pessoas, de professores que tinham, digamos assim, uma, uma vida intelectual relevante em Portugal. É, o Nobre quase chegou a ser professor, o Ilse Riqueira foi professor antes de ser bispo, é, primeiro bispo do Japão, e que é, estão atentos para esses casuísmos em diálogo com o que acontecia na cultura local. Então, era possível dentro do contexto de aceitabilidade de cada um deles, mas há aqui uma tentativa de é, colocar como uma, uma impossibilidade mediante a inexistência disso dentro da cultura silvícola dos índios brasileiros e da cultura dos japoneses. Não sei se responde isso. Muito obrigado. Doutor, o comentário do Luiz Seijo há uma dúvida que eu acho relevante, porque quando nós estudamos a, a história dos povos nativos do Brasil, nós vemos uh, acentuados diferentes entre não apenas uh, línguas linguísticas, entre diferentes grupos, ou seja, é impossível falar realmente índios como algo monolítico. Uh, nós vemos uh, diferentes estilos de vida condicionados pela geografia, pelos recursos disponíveis em cada localidade. E há, por exemplo, aquela obra do, não sei se é conhecido em Portugal, mas o Fórum São Fernandes, sobre a função social da guerra entre os Tupinambás e, e, e a sociedade que o, que o Fórum São Fernandes descreve naquele livro não funcionaria sem a guerra, porque as, as aldeias Tupinambás estavam, funcionavam como pequenos espartos, na verdade. Era um, era um grupo indígena bastante belicoso. E outros grupos eram pacíficos e dedicados à agricultura. Eu queria saber se os, os, os padres já chegaram no Brasil, as diferentes levas, conseguiram uh, colocar esse, esses conflitos e essas diferenças tribais uh, em quadro, com, com o próprio enquadramento intelectual uh, ibérico deles em perspectiva e ver essas diferenças e analisar essas diferenças segundo uh, o, o pensamento teológico e jurídico, obviamente. Não sei se, se na profundidade de tentar fazer a comparação e analisar segundo o, o, o pensamento jurídico, os ah, estados diferentes, ah, tendo visto comportamentos culturais de diversas tribos, 
Mas, por exemplo, já no 17, quando chegamos à altura do Padre Vieira, ele tinha um verdadeiro horror a uma, uma tribo específica do norte dele. Não sei se o professor é, Calabas, Calabas se recorda, mas uma tribo específica. Ele tinha horror, queria ver assim, como se diz no Brasil, queria ver o demônio, mas não vê esses <risos> índios. Esse, né? Tinha um ódio mortal que achava os realmente brutos, animalizados, uma coisa horrível. Né? E, e antes disso, figuras, figuras como, por exemplo, José da Costa, né? que vai. O seu caso de procurando em nome do Santo. Ele vai falar sobre diferenças, diferenças entre tipologia, é? ou seja, dos índios, por exemplo, que habitariam regiões da América como o Brasil, aquelas civilizações como, por exemplo, da Mesoamérica. Então já havia dentro dos quadros teóricos desses, desses jesuítas uma, uma espécie de distinção, porque saltavam os olhos a distinção entre essas tribos. Sim. Se observarmos, por exemplo, tribos do litoral, como, por exemplo, da nossa região do. Do, do Brasil, do Nordeste do Brasil, inclusive a minha cidade, nós somos potiguari, né? é um nome indígena, né? são comedores de camarão, então nós, os, os natalenses, habitantes do Rio Grande do Norte, se chamam potiguares até hoje, né? comedores de camarão, adoramos o camarão. E, e é por esses povos né? estarem ali, a beira do litoral, aquela, né? aquela uma rede de dormir, que é a invenção indígena, eram mais. Mas assim, praticava uma tropofagia. Tem um caso que eu vejo horrível na, é, na costa do Rio Grande do Norte, em que estava um navio português e é, os, havia um grumete, né? um rapaz de 15, 14 anos, né? e quando viu duas índias, duas belíssimas, né? ele se atirou na água e saiu. Foi nadar. Né? E o, a, a, a outra, o outro contingente do navio ficou a observar. E ficaram observando aquelas duas vezes, uma conversava com ele, que estava gesticular, e outra foi a, 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 atrás de, um, de uma árvore, de um mato, e pegou uma espécie de tacata. Enquanto ele conversava com a outra, a outra bateu na cabeça e, e todos viram aquela, aquela cena de antropofagia na praia, né? as duas ali cuidando de limpar para levar para trigo né? nesse ritual ali feito. Mas apesar disso, eram um pouco mais brancos. Os do interior. Era aquela coisa absolutamente arredia, né? inclusive, inclusive foi objeto da organização pela Igreja Católica. Os mármores. Né? É, então, nossa, nossa região, inclusive, é muito abençoada. E agora tem mais de 30% dos, quantas regiões assim, em Lisboa tem o quê? Santo Antônio. Né? Nós temos 30. É o que eu Os colegas portugueses que na Lua ganharam isso foram é, índios católicos. E foram massacrados não, pelos portugueses. Era o português. Não era índios? Não. Portugueses ah, mesmo. A população portuguesa que estava reunida numa, numa, numa pequena capela, né? e os holandeses, assim, junto com os índios, eh, os índios janduís, ah, que eram sim, os mais, sim, sim. Mais, mais bravos, mais bravios do, do interior, se reuniram e fizeram ali uma espécie de carnificina. Foram mais de 30. Né, portugueses que foram martirizados, é até um tanto controverso. É, o número todo respeito aos caras. Não, não nem, nem só o número, né? Mas porque todos estavam ali na igreja rezando, né, na hora da comunhão, se, se não fosse uma atitude de piedade, né, se, se eu estivesse lá, está bem. Vamos aproveitar, vamos rezar, já está aqui para morrer mesmo. Então, né, eram, eram, índios, é, eram índios, esses índios de Anduís, eram índios mais bravios, né, que fizeram toda essa, essa, essa manifestação. Não só foram três focos de, 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 enfim, desse martírio, desse, dessa espécie de, de revolta ocorrida com o domínio holandês. Né? Inclusive, o chefe dessa, dessa expedição era, inclusive, alemão, era um judeu alemão, é. contratado pelo governo holandês para, digamos assim, empreender a conquista dessas regiões do Brasil. Disse isso apenas para reforçar a, essa diferença cultural ah. entre as variadas tribos, essas pequenas variações. Ah, Nosso Câmara de que é sempre uma referência sim. incrível no tema, né, faz um, um grande apanhado a respeito dessa, dessas regiões e como isso nos influenciou culturalmente, sobretudo em práticas alimentares do próprio interior é, do Nordeste do Brasil, que desconhece, por exemplo, alimentações com verduras, ou existem aqueles que até enxergam uma mutação alimentar, um componente da psicologia, não sei, não é minha área, mas é algo bastante interessante. Mas esses catálogos que eu fiz para ser mais objetivo, é, foram feitos pelos jesuítas, eu não sei se impactou efetivamente Sim. na teorização de estados jurídicos diferenciados, Sim. mas isso eles já percebiam. A culminar com Vieira, que detestava uma específica tribo que agora me foge a memória, mas em nove anos Obrigado. Mais alguma pergunta?
mas há alguma questão que quero colocar ou algum comentário que desejem fazer? Não havendo, agradeço, thank you very much, muito obrigado. Amanhã recomeçaremos os nossos trabalhos nesta sala, neste teatro, pelas nove e meia da manhã. Muito obrigado a todos.